good to see you all. I um, just want to uh, say that our numbers are trending in the right direction. I want to thank everybody, thank the public for uh, taking uh, protection measures seriously and we're headed in the right direction. And so that's good news and we just have to keep that going. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about aerospace. As you know, Snohomish County and Puget Sound are the home to the largest aerospace employment and manufacturing cluster in the United States. Um, and really the most important part of that cluster is Painfield Airport and Boeing Ever Plant. The, the Boeing plant, as you know, is their largest facility in the world. Uh, it's our number one employer. And it's also our number, has been our number one uh, tourist attraction uh, pre-COVID. So uh, a study done uh, January of this year actually showed that the uh, economic impact of Payne Field uh, accounted for over 158,000 jobs, and that's through the network and not just at Boeing, but other suppliers and, and elsewhere, and almost $60 billion in economic impact of the region. Uh, that is far and away the largest and highest economic impact of any airport in the state. And if I remember right, it's two or three times the economic impact of SeaTac. And this is all, of course, pre-COVID. Uh, due to the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the aerospace and aviation industry are experiencing you know, huge decline in demand for their products and services. And so we know they've been uh, aggressively seeking to reduce costs and maximize efficiencies, which a lot of businesses are having to do uh, worldwide. So we are not alone in this. The potential con consolidation of the 787 production line in South Carolina uh, coupled with the plan to end production of the 747 in 2022 would have a significant impact on our economy, both at the county level and, and beyond. So we know uh, the company is going to have to make decisions, uh, dollars and cents decisions uh, to help them uh, get through this. Uh, we, we totally understand that. So, so last week we launched a campaign, a public and private partnership to make uh, the strongest case that we are uh, in it long-term relationship with Boeing. We understand that and uh, we think we are a great place to build, do business, build airplanes. We've led the nation in aerospace in the past and in innovation and the future of aerospace and advanced manufacturing we believe uh, will remain here no matter what. So our region and our county has been working hard to build a gold standard for workforce development system for the aerospace industry. And we also have a world-class educational training uh, system and training institutions and programs. So we have the infrastructure necessary to build the future and really want to benefit uh, and build upon our natural environment and quality of life here. Um, so our partnership with Boeing spans decades, over 50 years in Snohomish County. So we're going to work to make that partnership uh, stronger, whatever Boeing's short-term decision. We want to keep Boeing in Snohomish County for at least another 50 years. So we know decisions are going to have to be made in the short term, but we are very much looking to the long term. So we're hoping for the best, but planning for whatever outcome is announced. Um, these are tough times for everybody. It seems like every day is a new surprise, but uh, that's... Uh, as elected officials, that's why we're here, is to help our communities through this. So uh, the families affected, the company, and all the rest of it, we just send our best wishes, and we're, we're here to help as uh, much as possible, and we're going to focus on the long term. So uh, we are pleased uh, to get the news yesterday about an FAA grant for $5 million to paint field uh, to help us renovate one of the primary taxiways. So that is uh, that's $5 million uh, for physical improvements at the airport. Uh, at Payne Field, the county-owned airport. And this will really help us invest in that. Payne Field will remain vitally important into the future. So we're extremely grateful to Senator Cantwell, Congresswoman Larson, Senator Murray, Congresswoman Del Benny. Um, our partnership with the congressional delegation was really vital and they really uh, stepped up after uh, Payne Field was kind of left out of the CARES Act uh, dollars, protection dollars. Uh, they really scrambled to, to help us uh, in, get an investment into Payne Field. So we're going to continue to work on our economic health and efforts to recover from COVID and uh, we'll just uh, persevere. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Spitters uh, from the Snohomish Health District. Doctor. Oh. Oh.
Thank you, Executive Summers, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we're very grateful for the, the clear air that I see outside my window following the much needed rain in recent days, uh, clearing away the wildfire smoke. Uh, so that with that improvement, the health district resumed testing operations last Friday and Saturday at our regular daily uh, COVID testing site on Broadway in Everett. Testing is back to its regular schedule this week, which is available on our website at uh, snowhd.org forward slash testing. Speaking of our website, uh, those of you who frequent the page for data updates might have noticed a refresh over the last few days. I'd like to take a moment to walk you through a couple of the key pages on our website and briefly review the most recent data. Uh, so I'm gonna share a screen here with you. And so hopefully now you're seeing our, uh, our homepage here uh, and at snowhd.org. Uh, across the top, these are some usual icons to take you to uh, uh, places uh, in, on the Health District website for more information unrelated to COVID-19. Also down here, uh, some, some categories of general activity. There's a banner that slides across the top covering uh, three different uh, avenues of COVID activity, information testing and, and um, uh, influenza and COVID-19 information. And then you can uh, either scroll down here to this green icon, coronavirus information, or if you see it across the top, uh, you, can, you can click on it there. And then you'll come to our, our COVID, uh, page. And this is the new look. We have these icons to try to make it a little more user friendly for people visiting the website. And uh, the first I want to take you to this case counts and data site. So we'll go there. And we have three uh, main buckets here. One is a brief summary of our local case counts. Take a quick look at that. So uh, this shows the total number of probable excuse me, probable and confirmed cases cumulatively through the, the through yesterday. Here is a plot of number of cases per day. And then this is the smooth plot over time with that running two week average, which uh, as you see, we've come down just a touch further. Uh, things seem to be flattening a little bit. I don't have a clear explanation for that. We got much lower after the first wave before we flattened out. So. I'm hoping that that's just a, an aberration uh, over time, maybe related to the Labor Day holiday, hard to tell. We haven't seen any increased case counts uh, of any significant size or duration in any age group. Uh, so we'll just keep following that, but hoping as Ex Executive Summer said to stay the course, keep using the face coverings, keep up with the social distancing, Limit, limiting your gatherings and otherwise following the Safe Start guidance to try to push these numbers down, down further to uh, reduce transmission and put us in a better position to open up things like schools and the economy. Uh, I'm going to then go back to that page and I'll just briefly show you these other main sites off the data page. That middle icon is where you'll find our snapshot. If you click on this, you'll get the full snapshot. Uh, then uh, if you scroll down, there's previous snapshots. And then this is the weekly report that we put out uh, most recently through yesterday. Then again, back to that page. So we've looked at local case counts, snapshots, and reports. And then this is the data dashboard. It takes a minute or two to load, but this is the state database where you can look at statewide figures, Snohomish County, or any county you wish. Uh, and uh, that'll give you information on case counts, testing, hospital capacity, what have you. So uh, then we'll go back. Now we're back at the COVID homepage, a variety of other th uh, things, but I, I wanted to next go to uh, our, our testing information. So if we click on that icon, we, we come to this banner with three items. This is our testing schedule that you'll see right here. Here's a nice map showing you where we're located, where Broadway is coming off Interstate 5. 
Uh, here's the, and this is in the Everett School District parking lot between the Everett School District building and the Memorial Stadium. Uh, next is uh, the registration page where you can uh, click on the registration process right here and you'll go through a questionnaire to line you up to get assigned and scheduled a test. If for some reason you're unable to get tested at a convenient time or place through the, the health district testing, you can go to this table, which will show you information about where other places where testing is available, as well as where language services are available and a contact phone number for that testing site. And then last on this banner across the top is just if you have questions about whether you're eligible uh, for testing through the health district, you can take a look at this at this page and those those uh, criteria have not changed. Um, so next I just wanted to talk a little bit more about travel testing. I'm going to stop sharing and come back to our main screen. Uh, so about testing for travel. Uh, we have had large number of people calling the health district asking about testing for travel or similar kinds of needs for administrative needs for testing rather than health uh, related needs. Uh, we are currently offering travel testing at our drive through locations, but it's important to keep in mind two things. One, results average three to four business days. We cannot guarantee that you will be able to get your results in the time frame required by your destination's uh, um, parameters. And our staff have rolled out a new process to provide proof of testing that individuals can use to show healthcare providers uh, for travel related needs. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that if uh, testing supply, if testing demand begins to exceed the supply of tests we have available, then we might need to look at, at uh, retreating from providing that kind of testing. But for the time being, that's, that is available. It's just important to remember that when you use the health district system for testing, uh, you really need to just go with the flow and get the results back as they come. We and the laboratory are doing the best we can. However, we cannot rush results to meet personal deadlines uh, uh, for medical procedures or for travel. There are other testing resources, as I mentioned, in Snohomish County as shown in that table that we highlighted, but their turnarounds may also fluctuate based on demand at the labs and demand at the testing locations. We also encourage checking with your insurance, your health insurance, and being prepared for the possibility of having to pay out of pocket for the testing if it is for travel purposes uh, other than for medical purposes. The health district testing is free, but at other venues you may have to pay. I'd also like to remind everyone in this context that non-essential travel still isn't really recommended at this time as Snohomish County is in phase two. If you do need to travel, please do your research first about any requirements at your destination regarding COVID-19. Many international locations either require a two week quarantine or are completely off limits for people from the United States at this time. Uh, for those countries or states where you can travel, check with your destination about any necessary quarantine or pre-travel testing requirements. And remember that travel requirements may change at any time. It's also possible on international travel, uh, you know, not to scare people out of traveling if they need to, but uh, my family recently had to do this. If you go, you have to be prepared that you may get stuck there and may not be able to get back on the timeline you had originally hoped or planned for. So uh, in that light, always remember asking about cancellations or refunds. Uh, countless plans have already been disrupted and we're not through this pandemic yet. So if you book a vacation, even months in advance, be flexible and understand that you may have to cancel or drastically modify those plans. We know there are people who do have travel plans and there are people who have essential re reasons to travel related to their work or family emergency. But otherwise, uh, the health district would suggest that now is not a good time for a vacation that takes you far from home. And instead, we do encourage you to explore the great places that Snohomish County has to offer uh, with a face mask, of course. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Executive Summers. Thank you, Doctor. Um, 
I do not see any questions in chat yet. Are there any questions? We may have finally answered them all. Oh, here we go. Are there any lessons learned from the second surge of cases knowing waves of virus activity are inevitable? Doctor? Well, I think that that's uh, maybe the first lesson is the second clause of your question, which is that until we arrive at a state with uh, more widespread immunity at this time, like, likely, most likely to be delivered by a vaccine over the course of the next you know, nine to 15 months, uh, if, if things go well as planned, uh, that it, it looks like it would be inevitable that we're going to bump into uh, inc transient increases in cases and then uh, we kind of buckle down a little bit more and, and, and try to bring that under control. So I think that's the first lesson. Uh, let's look back at the first two waves. First wave primarily affected uh, elderly uh, folks, not exclusively, but certainly in the severe end. Uh, especially those living in long-term care facilities. Second wave was more uh, younger adults uh, in the wake of uh, us moving into phase two. And I think uh, both bringing uh, more people out into the workplace where they're uh, working with others or working with customers that increase the number of interactions and, and carry risk of transmission. Also, I, I think that uh, a lesson, an anecdotal lesson we got from well, not anecdotal, but multiple uh, multiple vignettes over time that, that uh, getting together in groups larger than recommended does carry uh, risk of transmission. And it's not always a huge group. You'll remember back when we were in the heat of it, most of our cases that reported uh, meeting with other folks were, were doing, it wasn't 500 or 250, it was 10, 20 at a house party or a barbecue, that sort of thing. So I, I think this virus is teaching us that we, we really have limited margin for error in, in uh, trying to circumvent or, or ne uh, not necessarily trying to neglect, but neglecting all of those prevention measures that we've got in place. It seems like we really need to keep all those on our minds as we move forward to try to limit uh, the extent to which the virus resurges, especially in the wake of uh, liberations in activity, if you will, returns to school, if we advance to another phase, those are again times when we're going to be at risk and really need to double down on our efforts around face coverings, distancing, and get lim limiting our gatherings. I'd just like to add, I think if you look at the, uh, the first wave and as we were coming out of it, I think a lot of people thought it was over, that we had gotten past it, and so the actions we had taken to that point were primarily stay at home. And if you remember, if you, the streets were quiet and the roads were quiet. And so that, that was very effective, but there was a lot of skepticism about masks and social distancing outside of that. So as we came out of that, I think a lot of people did just were not taking it seriously enough. We've had that experience now, what happens. Um, and if you think about it now, if you go, uh, into public places and into particularly retail establishments. Masks are now uh, the standard and normalized. Very few people uh, not wearing masks. So I think we've all been educated and been through this a lot and that'll help uh, us you know, in the future. And there, there was an add on to the question. Um, at the end of the first wave, we entered phase two and folks seemed to let their guards in. How do you plan on limiting that this fall? especially as more folks return to the normal. I know we've been working hard at the county to put uh, protections in place at, at the office, but frankly, we're gonna continue uh, telecommuting and I think a lot of businesses that can do that are gonna do that. So I don't see us returning to normal, uh, the pre-COVID normal anytime soon. But um, again, people understand much better now uh, the risk set. Any other comments on that, doctor? And there's a follow-up question about uh, when we hope to get to 25 cases per 100,000 and the possibility of applying for phase three and any recommendations for schools allowing some sort of in-school learning. Yeah. Well, uh, to, just to, to second your comments, uh, I think that this, 
second wave really showed us that we really can't let our guard down with this virus and that even when things are looking good as they have been lately, uh, we've really got to keep doing all the preventive measures and that will persist even once uh, vaccination is rolling out until we really see a long-term retreat of the virus from a significant activity. Uh, even with vaccination, we're going to all need to continue to use face coverings, try and limit our gatherings, keep our distance from folks that aren't members of our household. And, and wherever possible, things like uh, remote work and uh, finding alternative ways to do things to adapt to this new normal, which really will uh, persist uh, for some time still. We're, we're still in the middle of this. And so I'd say, you know, hang on and keep doing the good work you're doing. And, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't uh, anticipate the end of this prematurely. Uh, as far as further driving cases down, uh, you know, certainly that's my hope that it'll continue to go down. Uh, but th th you can see from our curve, the reality is that's starting to flatten out. And if you extended that line just uh, the way it seems to be going, we wouldn't reach 25 uh, cases per 100,000, possibly before we hit the next wave, or even if there wasn't a next wave for many, many, many uh, weeks or months into the future. That line is almost flat over the last week or two. So uh, right now, the, uh, although things are looking better, the, uh, the Safe Start program has not been reopened to applications to advance and we uh, continue to uh, work with and wait for the, the Department of Health and the governor's office to make any announcements in that, in that light. And we certainly will, we're gonna continue doing our best to stay well positioned to advance uh, the economy and public life just as best and as soon as we can do so safely. With respect to the schools, our, our guidance remains unchanged that uh, now that, that they, we ha as a county have descended below that high transmission range up above 75 cases per 100,000 for two weeks. Uh, we're in that 25 to 75 medium, uh, medium risk zone, which uh, in the state framework allows schools to start looking at putting elementary school, elementary school students back into school either on a hybrid basis or if space were to permit uh, full time and to do so in a layered fashion, do so slowly. And uh, I think many of the school districts are planning to do so. We had recommended waiting for three weeks after Labor Day and the startup of school. And so we're in late September, early October, we'll be uh, transitioning. I think we'll see schools transitioning into that if everything else remains stable going forward. Just add, in, uh, in terms of the phase three, uh, we uh, are in discussions with the governor's office and the State Department of Health, talking about uh, maybe more nuanced, uh, not the full phase three, but uh, but looking at different sectors and how, what rules can be put in place um, on a case-by-case -case basis, so more of an incremental approach. And I know a few weeks ago, we uh, worked with the governor's office to develop rules uh, re regarding some um, recreational activities, pumpkin patches, uh, agritourism, um, fall events that everybody enjoys. And uh, the, the rules that had come out from the state would not have allowed those to occur. And working with them, uh, we came up with a set of standards, uh, really the industry did to allow those to go forward in a careful way, but still go forward nonetheless. And I think uh, you know, we'll continue those efforts on a case by case basis to work with the state and our local health officials to uh, really figure out how to proceed carefully. Um, so follow up question, uh, any updates on how Labor Day went? And uh, it's early, but numbers are still in decline. Also the health district, is the health district tracking cases from the anti-mask pastor uh, who visited Snohomish a week or so ago? Well, your, your, your question really points to the, the answer. It's, we're right on the cusp of being able to detect uh, uh, any surge from Labor Day, or for that matter, from uh, small numbers of children going back to school. Some of the high needs kids that can't learn offsite have now returned to school environments on, uh, in person. And uh, both of those were kind of simultaneous uh, at, during the first week of the month. We haven't seen any significant uh, increase in 
cases in school age children uh, or countywide in, in the total number, as you saw, things are flattening out. It's possible that that flattening is a, uh, a uh, lingering consequence of some gatherings or what have you that occurred over Labor Day. I think only time will tell. And I guess the hope is that if we really commit ourselves to these prevention measures going forward uh, and aiming to get that line going back down, that whatever that flattening is uh, will, will be uh, followed by a, a, a resumption of a more downward decline. And regarding the, uh, the visiting uh, uh, um, pastor, you know, we were aware of that uh, event. Uh, we did try to communicate with the with the church leadership, didn't succeed in doing so before the event, uh, have done so subsequently and provided all the guidelines and requirements uh, related to uh, faith-based organizations. And we'll certainly be asking cases about, uh, as we always do about their participation in any large gatherings, including that. Uh, I just, I wanna caution you that at the other end of the phone line, uh, we're likely to encounter reticence to report those things. We certainly, uh, noticed that lately, our case investigators noting uh, uh, individuals um, becoming a little more uh, reticent to mention gatherings uh, over recent weeks and months. And just to tag on to the early conversation, you know, our numbers are still declining. If you look at the state as a whole, we're stable, we're, we're declining slightly. So the state's doing a great job. Uh, so some other states around the country are, are not in such good shape. So I, I think uh, we all have to be proud and uh, difficult uh, for families and for businesses, but we're in a pretty good place and we've got just got to kind of hold the line and uh, keep going and hope that uh, some of the vaccines are successful and effective and come sooner rather than later. But, uh, you know, we're going to be in an extended period of uh, caution and uh, protection measures that need to be in place as we move forward. And uh, but everybody's adjusted really well, and uh, we're in a good place as a state because of that. And that means fewer people have died from COVID or become ill. So, good thing. Um, well, uh, one other pop-up question: Besides, folks not telling the whole truth, it seems uh, tracing is going well. How important is that sustained success? contact tracing. Right. Well, it's certainly a best practice uh, to, to do as much as we can with that. It's basically trying to put the brakes on transmission. It's not going to be perfect. We're not going to interrupt every chain of transmission, but if we interrupt enough, it can keep that reproductive rate than, uh, less than one. The average number of new cases that a single case leads to. If we can get that less than one and keep it less than one, we're going to keep going down. And that's, uh, that's the goal of case investigations, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantining of contacts is to try to limit the number of new cases arising from each case. I think it's had an effect. Uh, like I said, it hasn't completely stopped the pandemic, but I, I think it's contributed to putting the brakes on it uh, and is a great partner uh, at our end to all that you're doing at your end out there to, uh, again, follow all those recommendations and do the difficult things that are not convenient uh, and, and have a cost to them. But nonetheless, the vast majority of people are doing it and it's having an effect. Thank you all. This is Carrie in the Joint Information Center. It looks like that uh, wraps us up with the questions. I wanna thank you again for joining us this morning. And just a quick reminder, that we will not be having our regular media availability next Tuesday, but we do plan to resume the week after. Um, so please watch for those media advisories. So thank you again, and we'll see you in Zoom land again soon. Thank you. Good night.